Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Peer Geek Podcast and as always, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Now these are my favorite episodes, the ones where I bring on other people, other physical education experts from around the globe and uh, none other than Andy Milne joining us today on the show. How are you, Andy? Jared, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Very good. Now, I'm going to start by saying what time is it where you are right now? Okay, so right now it's 5 a.m. in the morning. The rest of the family are asleep, and uh, true to stereotypes, I've got a fresh cup of tea next to me. So I'm, uh, I'm locked and loaded and ready to roll. Yeah, so where is home for you right now? Because I know that you had a, a very spread out teaching career across the planet, um, but where do you teach at the present? Okay, so right now I'm teaching in Illinois. I'm in the northwest suburbs of Chicago in an absolutely fantastic school. Um, as you said, my, my career has taken me um, kind of around the world, I guess. Um, I did start in London um, way back in the day and, uh, and taught in three different schools in London, mm-hmm. or- originally finishing up in a, in a very, very prestigious boy, all-boys private school um, for for those of people who can, can kind of imagine British schools, imagine Hogwarts, and it's not far off of that. <laughs> and uh, and then I, I bumped into an American girl in a bar in London, and uh, one thing led to another, and I and I quit the dream job and sold the house and moved over to America and started all over again. And uh, and three schools later, I'm now in a school where I tell my students I'll be there when their when their kids come through the door because I don't plan on leaving. It's it's a fantastic environment in which to work. Yeah, isn't that isn't that say say a lot about good schools? Like when you get into them, there's this 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 absolute desire not to leave, um, and yeah. that's the same for the school that I happen to work in. And um, you know, I know that I've got a few friends who are colleagues that I went to you know university and so on with who have been moving back and forth between all sorts of different schools. Um, and I, yeah, I, I just haven't had that experience yet, um, knowing that the school I'm in is, is where I'd definitely want to be. So for you, you've had a very big, you know, checkered past of different schools and so forth. Where, along the way, where did this sort of interest in technology arise? Well, the, the technology thing, I, there, was a, there was an interest in technology when I was training to become a PE teacher, but okay. that was in the mid-90s, and I remember... Um, a good friend of mine taking up the, the technology elective, and uh, and I think they were using two megapixel cameras at the time, <laughs> taking pictures of kids uh, working out and making flashcards, and that was con- you know that and a laminator, and that was considered technology. Of course. Um, but it wasn't until I made the move to America, and I and I was in my my first real school here in the states, and day one there was an in service, and a guy came in and, and talked about tech that was booming in education and there wasn't much i can remember from his presentation but he did give us a two-sided piece of paper and it just listed um tech websites and and, and tech resources that we might like to check out that were specific to our subject area so I, mm-hmm. I i took that back to my desk and your your details were one of those on there and it must have been in one of the early days when your blog um and your website was flourishing you know in those early days and i know you talk about how you look back now and you can't believe some of the materials that you put out but that was a real um, motivator for me and whenever I had downtime I went back to that list and I went back to your website and just looked at what you were doing and worked out you know how could I implement that in my setup and at the school I was at um, the only piece of technology was my laptop at the front of the classroom and my iPhone in my pocket and my Mac at home So, you know, I was in a way I was blessed that I didn't have many resources because it forced me to think a little bit more and how could I get the students involved. So through that, I started investigating into podcasts that I still do today. Um, We had a class blog on Blogspot um, and we played around with a few different things. And uh, I think I'll attribute all of my tech work that I did in those three years to then getting this dream job that I have now. Um, so when it came to applying and talking about my strengths, I was able to send um, a, a, a letter of application that had a ton of live links on there. And uh, and the, the head of department even now says that it came into his inbox and he didn't know what to do with it. So he bounced it to Andy Horn, who I work alongside, and he was the tech guru in the department. And he was the one who sat down with all of those live links and was able to look at some of my online work and then said to the boss, okay, I think we need to call this guy in for an interview. So technology has definitely got me where I am today. Isn't that amazing? And I think you made a really good point at the beginning there about 
um, being in a school that was low resourced and and sort of using that as um, a means to think you know bigger and more creatively about the situations um, how have you found that as a difference to where you are now <laughs> that's a really good point because we could be described as well resourced yeah um, and I think I think I still lean back towards um, the things that I know and the things that I feel most comfortable with. I mean, I've been I've now been podcasting since, gosh, oh eight. Mm-hmm. So that's quite a while now. Yeah, so I think that my my yeah I think my podcasting and my and my iMovie work um, is is something that I feel very comfortable with. So it's easy to go back to what you know. Mm-hmm. But at the same point, you know, because because cost isn't really an issue, um, I am encouraged to try anything new. And I will. I'll try anything new. And you know, I'm sure you're going to ask me. You know, what have I tried in the past that's failed? It really doesn't matter. You know, I'll try anything. See if it makes my teaching better. If it if it helps the students, uh, and if it works, I'll implement it. And if it doesn't, I won't. And something's got to be very good for me to have to bump things like iBook author, uh, Garage Band, <laughs> iMovie off yeah. of my my yeah. go to list of resources. For sure, I, I feel the same. I mean. I will. I don't see any problem with the failure that can arise from attempting something new, and yeah. um, I think there's lessons in in that. And and I, you know, like learning is very messy. I always say, and uh, <laughs> that's the same for teachers. I mean, we're we're just the same as the students. I think we're learners. Um, you mentioned your couple of go to tools there, iMovie and so forth. Yeah. What would be a typical sort of activity that you might use them for? Um, okay, so. The first real school that I, I ended up here in the States, we didn't have textbooks in the classroom. And again, I saw that very much as a positive. I know there's that uh, that real hashtag ditch book uh, momentum that's f- going around out there online, um, you know, and encouraging teachers to create their own materials. Mm-hmm. So I was able to um, start a curriculum from scratch and, uh, and started playing around with iBook author. So I now make my own textbooks that are very interactive. Um, which means that the resources that I put and the links that I put into my books are very specific to my cohort of students. So when we talk about, because as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a health teacher now more so than a PE teacher. Um, if I'm talking about drug use, I'm not, the facts and figures that I put in my books aren't drug use figures for America. They're drug use figures for my high school, uh, for my local community as well. So all of my materials are extremely specific to the, the wants and the needs of my kids. Um, and all the resources that I put in the back and the and the websites that they want to check out and the hotlines they need to call are all within our building or within our community. So when it comes to health, um, often the iBook gets opened up on our students' iPads. We're a one-to-one iPad school, and we have been for a few years now. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll work through that, and then I'll give students the opportunity to, to explore some of the links and go off, perhaps uh, do some project-based learning. Um, I've, I've been very successful with two projects, uh, one on goal setting um, where I wrote an iBook. Uh, it was 10 weeks worth of material and week by week we worked through it and students set a health goal, worked towards it and achieved it. And then the following semester I did one on advocacy mm-hmm. where we, we identified um, areas within our school building where kids were hurting uh, when it came to things like thoughts of stress and depression and, and suicide. And again, students chose a topic that resonated with them. And over 10 weeks, they um, explored, you know, I gave them voice, I gave them choice. And, uh, and they worked towards an advocacy topic and an advocacy um, campaign that raised awareness amongst the student population. So I, lo- I, love, I love iBook Author um, and the way in which it takes me no time at all to put extended links in there. And 99% of the students might not look to those links, but the one, you know, the 1% who's truly passionate about that topic can just continue to explore and take their learning off in a direction that suits them. Yeah, it's more organic too because, um, like you said, you're using content that's relevant to them in their particular area as opposed to some uh, expensive textbook which is has been prescribed based on a sort of top-down <laughs> level. Uh, I think it's incredible. Yeah. It really is. So, um, I mean, iMovies as well, how does that sort of fit into it? Are they going into iBooks or is this for a different project altogether? Or no, we, um, the, I, I can get students to make iBook, uh, iMovies. So, uh, for example, they make, 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 make a, an advocacy uh, public service announcement. So, look, you know, write a script, do, do the research, look directly at the camera, um, record the video, um, and then we'll, we'll show it to the rest of the class. Uh, when, we, when we look at um, fitness, 
we'll go down into the field house and uh, and the big assessment that we have is students have to show what they know through an, an iMovie. So in small groups, they'll, they'll show their workout, they'll talk about um, what it is they've done, they'll name the muscles, they'll talk about the theory, and then they chop that together. What I then do is book out um, a large room in our school that has a giant screen. Um, I have a little ballot form. Uh, we come in and we have a mini Oscars. So the groups get up. So cool. um, they'll, they'll present their video. I've also done split screen where I've done a back channel on, on the other side of the screen. So while we're watching the movie live, you've got students typing uh, as fast as they can to give feedback to the kids who are watching their own movie. And then we have the little uh, the Oscar ballot. And I bought uh, mini Oscar trophies online. Uh, and every semester I award Oscar trophies to the winners. And, uh, and that becomes quite a powerful motivator as well. Oh, for sure. And I'm just thinking like that, that concept of an Oscars award ceremony applies to so many different things you could use video for. Like, um, you know, it could be a gymnastics routine or a, whatever. I mean, if the students are creating video, this, yeah. this extrinsic idea becomes really quite impressive. So you're a one-to-one -one school. Um, the students obviously have their devices. What's been sort of the, some of the biggest challenges around that in the school setting? What is funny is that um, so there's 4,000 kids within our, within our two schools that we have. We're split on, on campuses, and, and every child has, a, has an iPad. Many kids aren't as big a fan of, of the iPads as, as I thought they would be. I'm, a, I'm an iPad super user. I try and use it in every class, you know, when appropriate. But I know there's, at the same time there's teachers in the building who will probably ask kids to turn them off and, you know, put them under their desk and dig out the textbook. And, again, that's fine as long as the learning goes on. And, trust me, it does go on in my school. It's very, very good. Um, so sometimes attitude. Um, you know, sometimes it's just poor preparation from the students. I forgot to charge my iPad. Um, so you try and make sure that you've got spare cables uh, in the rooms. We haven't got round to having a charging station in every room yet, but I, I believe that that's coming. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there was the occasion when my, my boss came in to observe me teach, and I had this amazing lesson set up with the iPads, and they'd go to links, and they'd, they'd work on a shared Google Doc. And, of course, the Wi-Fi went down. Um, now, I guess in, in previous schools, I probably would have panicked a bit, you know, and we'd have, we'd have fluffed our way around it. But because I work in a well-resourced school, a kid pops out his iPad, his iPod, um, iPhone and, uh, and sets up his own little hotspot and says, all right, everyone, jump onto my hotspot. We're ready to roll. And yep. then we just carried on working. So <laughs> lesson learned. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, I'm sure that's probably not the only thing that's happened um, in your classroom around using tech and, and so forth. Well, yeah, I mean, th there's also the, 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 the big learning lessons that, that happen when students misuse technology. Um, that, that, that temptation is there, um, and I think it would be unfair to expect kids not to push the, the boundaries and the limits. And, and I guess, you know, as you know, there's two ways in which we, we have approached technology in the past. One is when you see those signs as you walk into a classroom that says, you know, no cell phones here with a big circle and a line through it. You know, tech is not to be used in this room. Or you let the student, you know, you give the students the guidelines, you let them use it, and when they cross cross those guidelines, obviously that's that becomes a learning experience, and Absolutely. students get punished. But everybody learns from that, and and um, it happens. It will continue to happen. Um, uh, students aren't the finished article right now. They're they're young. They're learning. You know, we, we don't get. That's that's the the sad part of teaching. Sometimes is we don't get to see the finished article. Yep. We see these kids. They come through our door. We work with them. You know, and and they see, they look like they're these these shining lights, and then we lose them at eighteen. And then you just hope, and you can now, I guess, with the power of social media, you hope that one day they'll come back and they'll show you what they've become. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you touch on a a pretty good point there about um, the the you know how schools have approached this whole digital um, you know tools and so forth. And I I think they're having them in the class is, is a real world case study. I mean, when they get out into the real world, they're going to have them. They need to know how to, you know, use them appropriately because let's be honest, yeah. if they're banned, they're being used secretly. <laughs> that's the, that's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no lesson that can be learned there. So, I mean, I would much rather have a framework up that sort of guides appropriate use than bans, um, you know, and discourages Absolutely. and puts them under, under the mainstream um, which I see in, in so many cases, and it just doesn't work. 
Um, so I'm, I'm really happy that we sort of touched on that. So um, you've got these one-to-one -one iPads. Obviously, they're you know they're being used in some classes more than others, and when the learning mm -hmm. um, dictates it, which I think is best practice. Um, what about in the PE practical setting? What sort of things are they doing with them in there? Is it still just the iBooks and so on, or is there any other apps or so forth that you've um, enjoyed? Um, you mean, really, this is, at this point, it's where I need to call upon my good buddy Andy Horn and, okay. and ask what he's doing. Um, a Andy takes the tech to another level as well. Uh, awesome. So I know that in his PE lessons, he's, uh, he's definitely been using band delay um, yeah. Yeah. recently. Big um, you know, and yeah, obviously, and uh, you know, I think that's that's the most likely uh, use of tech that I have um, that I think involves real learning. It's just the the video of performance, mm -hmm. and then the opportunity to sit down and analyze performance. And again, I know that that there is an old school thought, you know, amongst old PE teachers that will say, you know, you're taking away from the activity time from the students, and and I think that that's the wrong way to look at it. Yeah. Um, obviously there's learning going on, um, you know, the opportunity to analyze your performance and, and give yourself that feedback and then to not only improve your own performance but that of those around you as well I think is crucial. Um, so, so that really is my, my go-to when it comes to, to the PE setting is just the, the video analysis. For sure. I mean, I think there's hidden value in, um, you know, helping others. And, I mean, I remember video for me being so motivational when I was, you know, 13, 14, just seeing, you know, a long jump of myself on this old video camera <laughs> inspired me to do so much practice and training. And, and I think there's a there's a hidden quality in there that, um, you know, as learning aside, it, it's motivational. And I think there's, you know, many reasons to pursue it. So I know you're a big podcast fan, um, you yeah. know, having your own and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Do you happen to listen to any other podcasts in your um, professional development, you know, outside uh, school hours? Absolutely, um, and, and I'm glad you, you brought that up, really, because I know that you have a long commute to work, um, and I do too. It's 70 minutes in each direction, um, and that's 70 minutes of my time. Um, so, yeah, I'm a big podcast user. I, I used to be a big fan of Stitcher, the, the Stitcher app, um, but now I've transitioned uh, back to the, 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 the gen generic one that comes with the iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, your one is great. Um, I'll listen to things like uh, the, the TED Talks. Uh, this American Life, anything from the BBC. I mean, <laughs> for, from the BBC Food Show to the BBC uh, uh, Country Files, anything that, that takes me back and reminds me of being in England. Um, yeah, you sure. know, my journey to America has been outstanding. But the, the BBC put out some fantastic content. Um, and then recently, I've been, I've, been, I've been moving away from PE uh, and health specific podcasts um, because I want to know more now. Um, so I've, I've been checking out. Uh, I'm, I'm actually pulling it up on my phone right now. <laughs> um, Snap Judgment and the Combat Jack Show are two podcasts that really deal with um, diversity uh, and inequity. Um, I've got here Curious Minds, um, Serial. Obviously, we're all, all big Serial fans. Uh, <laughs> certainly, certainly season one. Yeah, I think season, season two, season two, uh, not so sure. Not so um, good. Not so good. Uh, Matt Pomeroy and Colin Brooks put out the Shape America podcast, um, and, and I'm hoping to be a part of that in the future. There's Jorge Rodriguez and, and his whole team that put together the Voxcast. Um, there's the, there's a, you know, here's a really good one um, from the ASCD, the Whole Child podcast, a very good educational uh, podcast that will talk about pedagogy. I mean, there was a time when I would listen to audio books to and from school, but recently I think podcasting has really blossomed and really bloomed. I think technology has helped. I think people's confidence has increased. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've now realized just how easy it is. I was making podcasts with one phone and a Mac, um, and you can put out really good quality work. So 70 minutes to school, um, you know, I'm listening to a couple of podcasts there, a couple of podcasts back. I'm learning without realizing. Absolutely. And I, I, I just absolutely a testament to how simply, you know, they are to consume. And, uh, I mean, once upon a time, there was a lot of friction around how you would get it from the Internet and get it onto your device. But that's sort of disappeared now. And um, yeah. You've just seen this explosion in creativity of people in the space. So, I mean, Serial was, was great and, big, you know, it sort of took it to a new level. Mm. Um, but, you know, if you're listening and this is the only podcast you listen to, 
Um, there's so much out there, and I, I go and hit that search box and uh, type in some of the names, or head along to this the show notes for this particular episode, and, and we'll have links um, to the different things that were mentioned. But yeah, I'll leave it at there. I think Andy, that's been an absolutely incredible episode, full of <laughs> full of lots of different things, right back from um, your early days with tech use all the way up to um, how you stay current with the professional development online. So um, where can people find out more about you if um, you know they wanted to catch up with your journeys and so forth? Okay, you can find me on Twitter. I tweet as Carmel Health. I used to teach at a school called Carmel, and uh, I think I owe something to them. So I, I'll always keep that as part of my, my social media presence. So I'm Carmel Health. Uh, I also have a couple of blogs. Um, slowchathealth.com is one that I've been going with the last six to eight months uh, inspired by Justin Schleider um, I have a, a blog post once a, month, once a week and I post out daily questions so you'll find that with the hashtag slowchathealth and then I have another blog um, that I share with Andy Horn called tools to engage that's the number two tools to engage dot <laughs> wordpress dot com you can find me on Voxer you know I'm you know <laughs> If you can find, if you want me, you'll be able to find me. Yeah, perfect. All the links for those uh, blogs and so forth will be in the show notes. So just look below, or if you're on the phone, um, yeah, click through any of the links, and and you'll be able to catch up with Andy. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, getting up at five a.m. to to come onto the episode, and I uh, look forward to speaking with you soon. Jared, you take care, mate. Appreciate it. See you, mate. Bye. Mm-hmm.